Um, uh, so I think we are done with the question and answer. And uh, if you're going to stick to the time, so we're going to move to the next talk. Uh, so the next two talks are by uh, a very uh, accomplished uh, cardiac surgeon. And, but uh, more importantly, uh, I've learned with him as his fellow and then worked with him as his colleague. He's the surgical director of structural heart program at Mount Sinai. And probably the, his most recent claim to fame is the concept of commercial alignment, which he has pioneered, and now uh, the entire world uh, uh, of structural intervention is working around it. So uh, uh, we have asked him for two talks, and I'm going to interrupt him uh, to make sure he gives both those talks in time. Uh, Dr. Gilbert Tang is going to give the first talk on essentials of CT and TEE for structural heart interventions. Uh, so Dr. Tang, all yours. I think I need to be allowed to share a screen. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. We can hear you. Yeah. Um, I am yeah. not able to share a screen. Is that other participant is sharing? So, Dr. Reza, if you can stop screen sharing, uh, we can get Dr. Tang online. Yes, I'll do right now. Sorry about that, Gilbert. No worries. Thank you. I'm still Do waiting. You want to try sharing it? Huh. I, I have stopped. Yeah, it still says I cannot share screen while the other participant is uh, sharing. Oh, there we, let me see now. There we go. Okay, thank you. Um, hold on, we can still not see it. Um, yeah, can you see it now? Uh, no. Maybe give it a few seconds. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we can see you now. We can see them now. Yes? Yes, go ahead. Okay, great. Well, thanks very much. It's been a pleasure and honor. Thank you, Assad and the organizers for inviting to give these uh, two, I think, very practical lectures. Uh, there's very little data that I'm going to show you because I think um, you can read about them, but I think uh, to, to a hands-on standpoint, it's very important. So uh, let me just show you. This is the second talk, sorry. Let me uh, send you, share with you the proper talk. There we go. So this is the one that is on the essentials of CT and TEE uh, for structural heart intervention. Now, I'm not an amateur, as I mentioned. I am a uh, cardiac surgeon, but I've learned through my structural heart training and experience how to uh, interpret imaging uh, as well. So you can actually, uh, as a teaching operators, to use these imaging to their advantage during pr procedures to improve the, the safety and efficiency. These are my disclosures. So today we're going to talk about the role of CT and TEE in imaging uh, in structural heart and also how to uh, evaluate these patients and guide the procedures. So for CT, it's mostly dedicated to pre-procedural planning uh, in evaluating anatomy such as sizing, high-risk features and landmarks, where your access site is, where your implant view may be. But TEE is not just about anatomic evaluation, but also planning and also guiding the procedure, especially in mitral tricuspid. It also allows you to localize pathology, look at how severe the disease is, both these for TIR and TMVR, uh, and also maybe TTVR. And you can actually standardize these imaging views I'll show you uh, to make the procedure faster. The declare YouTube channel actually to uh, describe some of these lectures uh, on how to do this imaging, but also uh, on Fremencio in terms of pre-planning on CT. And so in terms of CT, as well, everyone knows, it's a gold standard in evaluating tower. And these are some of the anatomy the, the elements that we look at, not just the annulus and LVOT, but sinuses, STJ, coronary heights, where the calcium is located, uh, what the root angle is, is transfemoral feasible, uh, do we need to use other techniques like shockwave, uh, and also what the arch vessel anatomy it looks like if you plan to use cerebral embolic protection. So this is an example of a workup. You can see on the top right corner, this is the hockey puck view to look at whether it's a free leaflet or bicuspid valve. You can see the anatomy of the annulus and LVOT. We routinely do a one millimeter cuts to look at the morphology of the calcium and where it's located. 
So for example, if the calcium is located at the base of the annulus, it's going to be more uh, high risk of potential rupture if you oversize a lot to the uh, native anatomy. And next, you would see that here, that's annular and LVOT calcium. You would want to also see the STJ and the sinus for salva. Typically, if you use a balloon expandable valve, we would put a circle of the valve dimension onto this uh, image here to see how it might fit. If you have a very much oversized to the STJ, you may risk the section, especially if the frame of the valve extends above the sinotibular junction. You can see that here, the advantage of doing this kind of overlay is also this valve is positioned roughly 80-20. If you position higher, like 90-10 or 100-0, you may preclude yourself from potential redo tower in the future because you might obstruct the coronary uh, left main here. So that's also an important consideration in younger patients. So here is the landmark. So what we've learned is that you can actually look at the calcium on the CT and match it on the fluoroscopy. So what I mean is that when you put your balloon expandable valve here, you can see the top of the valve. You can line up with the sinotubular junction calcium or the left wing calcium. And so you can actually already before uh, going into the room to start looking for these landmarks once you go into the room when you get the coplanar view. Access obviously is very important. You can see we typically uh, highlight where we're gonna access in terms of the femoral head. So when you're doing floral, you can actually landmark it here. So we always go parallel to the vessel, not lateral and not medial to reduce vascular complication, particularly obese patients. Arch vessel anatomy is important in terms of cerebral embolic protection, but also if you use any kind of rigid device to track across the ascending aorta, you want to see, make sure you don't cause uh, injury. In terms of valve in valve, uh, this uh, review paper we published a couple of years ago shows a lot of different CT elements uh, to evaluate during valve in valve tower. And of course, everyone knows about the Vini Bapat's valve in valve app. You can see that here, you can figure out which surgical valve you use, and then of course, figure out which transcaptor valve you use. Now, just like transcaptor valve on floral, the surgical valve, all the different valves are shown here, and you can see which is which. So it's been very helpful on identifying the proper valve. And of course, depending on which type of valve, for example, the left side is a porcine valve, which is internally mounted. The internal ID, the true ID is gonna be much smaller than the internal ID versus, for example, mitral flow valve, the true ID is gonna be the same as stand ID. But even though they're the same size valve, the ID is gonna be smaller, you can see that here, than let's say a man of valve. In terms of redo time, CT is also very important. You can see this review paper that I've seen the author in. You can look at some of the elements included in the workout, and I encourage you to read that on your own leisure and also watch some of the YouTube videos on the workout and come and show alignment, of course, is critical for redo tower. And you can see these are two examples of videos that you can watch at your own time. Now, on the mitral side, there's also a mitral valve in valve app. You can use that as well. And of course, all the valves similarly to aortic are very different. So you want to understand which valve you're using. Again, you can do the same workflow, looking at which surgical valve you have, and you can pick the appropriate uh, balloon expandable valve. And you can see that here, one of the things that's important is not just the CT, but also fluoroscopy. You can see that this particular valve, uh, the mosaic valve, you need to look at the outflow because that's the only thing that is visible. Now, in terms of native uh, TMVR, you can see that here, this is the intrepid valve for Medtronic. There's a sizing criteria and you need to trace out the native annulus. And based on that, you oversize to a certain degree to allow anchoring. But more importantly, now everyone knows about this whole concept of neo-LVOT. What neo-LVOT is, this is a native LVOT. I'm looking at from the surgeon side, from the aortic valve side, you can see this is the whole opening. Once you have the new TMVR in place, you now cut off the valve uh, with the neo-LVOT. Now it's only this much, like a crescent shape. So this has to be large enough to allow cardiac output and the blood to leave the heart. If you have less than, for example, 200 millimeters square uh, in the balloon expandable valve and in self-expanding valve, such an intrepid may be around 150 millimeters square, then you may potentially compromise and cause LVOT gradient. And you can also use dynamic modeling here, like you see, that if you see septal contact uh, as part of the cardiac cycle, that is definitely a cause concern for obstruction. Now, it's not just the, uh, in terms of the neo-LVOT, the number of elements that can risk obstruction. 
So aromatic angle, how long the native leaflet is, how thick the septum is, how much the valve is in the ventricle, how much it flares out and how much it oversized, all of these factors can risk LVOT obstruction. That's why it's so hard to model these patients and that's why it's so hard to screen them into these trials. Now, in terms of map, we see more of that now, of course. You can see there's over 50 shades of map. Every one is different. And so the workup is also very important in terms of looking at not just the annular sizing, but also how much map is there. For example, this one doesn't have a lot. It's only around 270 degrees. So a balloon experiment valve will risk paravalve leak. Also, we want to look at the aeromatural angle, the septal length. You can see that here in this case, clearly you obstruct the LVOT, so this will not be feasible. Also, you want to see how thick the mac is and how tall it is, because that will allow increase your landing zone with the balloon expandable valve. Now, changing to tier, I think it's also important to standardize the imaging. You can analyze the valve on TEE, look at the basic views, the valve area, the gradient, uh, look at transeptal access, but also device steering and grasping are very standard now in terms of views, and I'll show you what they are. So for, of course, the first is the four chamber view. Everyone knows how to do this. And also it's important now to show this utilized biplane on the TEE. So you can see this is an X8 probe, which is the latest Phillips probe. And you go in the bicom control view, which is around 60 degrees usually. And you now put the cursor across and you'll see the grasping view right here very nicely. And you can also show it with color to see where the jet is. And so what you do is that you actually do a sweep. You go from lateral medial and go back to lateral with the metal color to look at the exact pathology and where you go to grass. And of course, you need to look at 3D on false as well, because that will allow you to show later on clip orientation, the pathology. And you can see that here, this patient has a P2 flail here. That's where the jet is. And you can see that so you can compare it to after the procedure. And you can see that now the clip is in place in the bicomercial view. You want to make sure the clip on this view, uh, you don't see the arms. And also the shaft is pretty much coaxial, perpendicular to the annular plane. And you can see that here on the X-plane view that you can, the trajectory is optimal relative to where you get a grass. You can see that here in the ventricle, so it does not change. And this is very important in terms of the 3D view. You can see that here, you want to make sure your commissures are 10 and 2 o'clock. And this, if it's an A2P2 grass, you want to see, make sure it's a 12 and 6 o'clock. Now, floral is also very important. You can see that here on the RAO view, you want to see this is the analyst. On the LAO view, it's facing you directly. So you want to be able to see this is medial, this is lateral, this is anterior, this is posterior. That's kind of how you know the transeptal and steering, and this is lateral medial here, anterior posterior. It's very important to learn the fluoroscopic imaging as well. But also in terms of grasping, you can see that when you grasp, if you go to ARIO projection, your echo already shows you an orientation of the clip. You want to make sure there's no parallax. You can see that here of the clip arms, and that's been published in the Sky uh, ebook on micro clip so that you maintain the orientation. Floral is, has much better definition than echo. Uh, so, Dr. Tang, and two so minutes left for see, this talk. Yes. Two minutes for this talk. Two minutes Yes, left. no problem. And you can see that here the TE assessment at the end. In terms of TMR, it's the same thing. You can see by common show view, LBOT explaining the same thing and how you deploy intrepid valve. In terms of tricuspid, just quickly, you can see each device is unique. And so these are some of the screening questions. You can see in terms of what you need to uh, look for. It's more complex, obviously. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but these are the views. You can see that a lot more than just mitro and especially uh, MPR. And you can see that here, this is a list uh, of the essential echo views. There's some of the green, yellow, and red zone in terms of the difficulty, including leaflet length, leaflet tether, gap, cooperation reserve. One thing I'll show you what the reserve means is that if you have symmetric B, like mitro, it's going to be straightforward. But if it's asymmetric, it's tethered with the septal, it's going to be harder to hook it to grasp. And finally, if the leaflet's uh, flat, it's going to be the hardest to do. And even a horizontal RV makes the steering more difficult, and that's why we need to pay attention to this as well. So in terms of intraoperative imaging, you want to align the probe, you want to reduce acoustic shadowing. And so here's an example. You can see that here, the key is says RV inflow, and you can see you do the sweep like you do uh, in the 
just like magic clip. The transcatcher view is very important to look at clip orientation and where the jet is. Now that we know that there are five liquid morphology of the tricuspid valve, so we can use 3D multiplanar reconstruction from uh, TEE to, to guide the clip implantation. So you can do all the views in one. And of course, you can do that in 3D or 4D ice as well. In LAAO, I think CT is also now the standard followed by TEE in terms of complement. And TE is still the standard, but also 3D ice is not an alternative uh, in terms of LAAO. So in summary, I think CT and TE are essential imaging modality to guide pre-procedure and planning. We really need to meticulous workup to optimize procedure safety and efficacy. And you can see that by standardizing these TEE imaging, you can really improve procedural time, reproducibility, and also you can do it for more different types of procedures. Thank you very much. Perfect. Thank you. So without wasting much time, uh, Dr. Tang, you can... Yeah, I'm going to go to... We'll have Q&A after the, uh, both the talks are done. Okay, so I'm going to talk about transeptal technique. This is a, actually going to be a bit shorter talk, so it should be okay in terms of time. Here's my disclosures again. So the uh, objective is is uh, look at transeptal uh, access cannot, for mitral valve uh, interventions and also looking at echo and floral imaging as well because they're interrelated. Sorry, we, we can cannot see, see your slides yet. Sorry, hold on. One. Can you see now? Yes, perfect. Yes, okay. Yeah. So you can see that here we're gonna look at transeptal and you can see this very well-known review from 2016. So how many different procedures you can do now with the left side of uh, heart. So it's the key to any left-sided structural heart procedures. And transeptal procedures are actually not just floral guided, it's actually more now but TE is really TE guided, but also you have floral to assist you to identify the landmarks, the optimal position, and of course detect complications. So here's the review paper showing you where the to puncture. So for my clip is typically mid posterior. Now TMVL and LAO is inferior posterior. We rarely go anterior. You can see that here unless for EP procedures. So part of the tier procedure is not just to plan how many clips, where you're going to clip, but also where you're going to puncture the septum. Is it going to be difficult? You know, how you're going to steer the clip, how you grasp, and so you need to understand both echo and flow, as I mentioned before. Okay, you can see that the mitral clip G4 system, this is the working shaft, is five to five and a half million centimeters. That's why you need to have at least four to four and a half centimeters for transeptal, the higher the better. And you can see that depending on the primary versus secondary MR, primary you're going to even have to get higher because so that you can grasp the flail or the prolapse. So for example here, if it's more medial, you need to get more height because you need to make the turn to get to the medial pathology. If it's lateral, you can afford to lose a little bit of height, but you still need to have four centimeters ideally so that you don't have to worry about septal fatigue and losing support as you do your steering. So this paper, as I mentioned before already, about triceptal technique. All of you are familiar with these equipment, so I'm not going to go into details, but these are the imaging views. Everyone knows this now. This is the bicable view, and now we routinely do bicable explains so you can actually see how posterior you are. This is the aortic valve short axis, but to see how posterior you are, and you can actually flip the image when you do the explain, and you can see that here with the four chamber to look at the height. These are standard views. And the reason why you go down from superior to inferior is not to gain height. You can see that here, this is the mitral valve. Anterior leaflet, posterior leaflet, anterior, posterior. So when you come down from the SPC, you're going more inferior, but you're actually going more posterior to the mitral valve. As Becky Heim will teach you, you want to go with your tan tank, ideally behind this intercumbent show line right here. So you want to go roughly, that's why mid fossa is better than anterior fossa. If you go superior and you go anterior, you're going to end up what we call aorta hugger, and that will make your steering more difficult. 
especially in TMBR. Now, in terms of the posterior, how do you gain height? So this is a transeptal needle. To gain height, you need to clock your needle to gain height to go posterior. Here's this is the interatrial groove. Again, let me show you. Clock to gain height. Counterclock to lose height. So that's kind of how why, you know, to gain height is not just going down or up on the floral, it's actually going clocking to go posterior. I'll show you how that works. You can see this is already imaging that I showed you. You see ASD device, you see two clips. And so when you see this here, again, just to refresh your memory from my last talk, medial lateral, posterior anterior. So on the aerial view, when you go posterior to gain height, you go going to the left side of the screen. Not going down, not going up, it's going to the left side of the screen. On the LAO, you can see that here. It's going this way. So you start with the transeptal sheep on the SBC, you can see that here, the ovary two wire, everyone knows this now. And then you can see we advance the needle near the tip of the dilator. And then you come down. And typically we would go into aerial projection to see how anterior you are, but you can see this is the drop that you look for in your echo and floral. So here's how it looks like by cable. You can see the tenting here. And you, when you come down, typically now what we do is do a biplane. And when you do a biplane, you see how posterior you are like this, but in a mirror image, you flip. So you can in real time come down and the echo, tell the echo person to get the cursor from here and sweep to the left side until it drops and you see both at the same time. And then you can measure the height now, when you measure the height, make sure you're measuring properly. You need to draw parallel lines and then measure. In terms of steer, you have to see where your leaflet is. If your leaflet is functional MR, it's going to be better. You're going to be below the annular plane, so you might be able to get more height. But if it's flail, you need to make sure you have enough height above the annular plane. Very important. As I mentioned before, clock to gain height, counterclock to lose height. And once you cross, you want to make sure you have a wire access in the pulmonary vein or the appendage. So you can see that here, we typically would use this for aerial projection. You can see again, superior, inferior, posterior, interior, how the orientation is. And you can see, look at other lemma. This is the mitral valve. So you can see there's a little bit of a map present. And when you do your transeptal, if you're using mechanical needle, you can see that here, make sure the flush port and the dilator curve sheet and dilator are all aligned. You want to make sure you separate yourself in a fixed distance. And you can see that if you have a fixed distance and you advance the needle, that's when the needle will come out. So be careful when you do that as you start puncturing to keep this in a fixed manner. Some people use a safe step wire to do a kind of small atraumatic puncture in case you do repuncture because you don't have to make a big hole. And you can see that here, this is what I mean, that you can, with the short axis and you explain, you can see the two two planes of where the wire is across the septum. Of course, you can use floral as well, as I mentioned, in congestion echo. So we do is synate this, so you know exactly where you puncture here. This is where the spine is, this is where you puncture, so you know how far you're inside the left atrium once you cross with the sheath and dilator, as you see here. Uh, two minutes left. So, yeah, so in terms of septal fatigue and losing the height, you have to be aware of that. There's tight fibrotic septum. You want to make sure you can track the guide so you want to balloon the septum. Sometimes the leads can interfere with your optimal puncture site. Very large right atrium, you want to use a molen sheath to gain length. And if you kind of advance the sheath, use the 032 Pro Truck Ride to maintain access. In terms of puncture for valve and valve, as I mentioned before, it's more inferior as you see here. And you can see that you don't need to as much height as mitroplet. And you can see you, can, you need to balloon the septum, but the key is that you have to track this valve here nicely, like this kind of coaxial with the stiff wire, rather than if you puncture too, too high, too superior, then you'll be struggling. CT is not a must, but if you have funny anatomy like scoliosis, it's helpful to see how you're going to track the uh, uh, septal trajectory. So in summary, the steps are position BLK two centimeter from the tip, Save step by one centimeter. Attempt to advance with the safe step first. If you know, you can use the needle to help. And you confirm that on TE and floral. 
Bayless is similar. You can use the RF energy and the Bayless is an atraumatic needle. And so in summary, it's the most typical part of the transeptal uh, for transcaptal mitral procedure. You can use both aqua and floral and you know, optimize your puncture location and of course, be vigilant about potential complications. This is the app that Mansana developed. I would encourage you to download it. It's available on both Apple and Android. It teaches you all the different anatomy, tools, techniques on how to do transeptal safely. Thank you very much. Perfect. Uh, thank you, Dr. Tang, for uh, first of all waking up that early in the morning and sticking to time. So uh, we'll have the hall open for questions. I have just one question, like very frequently in Pakistan, what we are seeing is that these patients are refer referred to us pretty late, and by that time they have developed a pretty significant degree of chronic kidney disease. So what's your algorithm for patients who have advanced chronic kidney disease? Obviously we cannot deny them, ever. so how do you deal with it? Yeah, no, great question. So. Uh, one of the things that we do is they would call low-dose contrast CT if your uh, facility has that. So we give basically 30 cc's uh, of the injection. You time in such a way you only light up the annulus because in terms of the access, you can actually use a non-contrast CT, and we've done that as well, to actually uh, revalidate the uh, access. But the most important thing is the annulus sizing. So we do a 30 cc injection only and uh, uh, to time it in the root so we can see the root characteristics to actually evaluate the anatomy. Uh, another option to look at access is some people at the time of uh, a cap, you can look at, you can use IVIS if you have the ability to do that. Uh, but non-contrast typically will allow you to at least estimate uh, the access. Now, ha having said that, remember a patient with calcified anatomy for non-contrast, it overestimates the access. So you have to be careful uh, in terms of if it, the patient is borderline. But that's what we've done, uh, and that works out very well. And the other trick in terms of getting the coplanar view is to not to give any contrast. A side knows this very well. We, we, we taught our fellows this, is to use a pigtail and a JY or another pigtail to get the angle without giving a single dose of contrast. So you can actually do the entire TAVI with about 10 to uh, cc's of contrast, 10 to 20 cc's of contrast only. Perfect. Uh, do we have any questions from our panelists? There is a question on the app. Uh, it says, what's the cutoff for coronary heights for TAVA? Well, you know, it used to be for balloon expandable valve, you know, less than 10 or 11, which is sort of risky. It's not just the coronary height. So, for example, in valve and valve, we deal with low coronary height all the time, right? Because yeah. the valve is mounted superannular by surgeons, so the coronaries are definitely lower. What you're looking for is the sinus height and the STJ. If my coronary height is zero, let's say, when your STJ is very big and your sinus height is very tall, you're gonna have flow to the coronaries when you implant your valve. The other thing for native tower and even for valve valve tower is the leaflet, right? So if you look at the leaflet, that's the door that we're talking about. So if your sinus height is this, and your door, meaning the lever height is tall, doesn't matter your left main height, your left main height can be very high. But if you can imagine when the valve expands, it's gonna close off the sinus. And that's what you can call the cause the coronary obstruction. So if you have bulky lever, especially at the tip, we measure the length of the lever versus the sinus height. Doesn't matter what the coronary height is. So when you do your valve in valve, the VTC, VTC is only important if your valve sits below the STJ. This is very important for V2 tower, by the way. So when you leaflet the surgical valve or transcaptal valve, if your leaflet is going to pin above the sinotubular junction and your STJ is small, it's going to completely cause what we call sinus sequestration, and that's how you cause coronary obstruction. So those are the uh, variables that I measure. And on my YouTube video, you'll be able to see how I do those measurements. So I can encourage you to actually watch those videos. Perfect. And we also have a video for low coronary height and coronary obstruction as well. Perfect. So it's not just the number of uh, that we get from the height measurement. It's a combination of factors, as Dr. Tang explained. So if you don't have any more questions, we're going to move to the next session then. Okay. So, perfect. Thank you, Dr. Tang. Thank you so much for all you. the organizers. Bye-bye. We'll see you next year again. Bye.